hi guys it's me professor d and welcome back to my youtube channel on this video i'm going to be covering about elimination guys um if you haven't done so already you know what i'm gonna say please do not forget to like and subscribe below i've got audio lessons on my website available and soon i will also have study guides at nexusnursinginstitute.com don't forget to check me out across um my other social media platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Okay, guys, so without any further ado, let's get started. First question. Which of the following would the nurse expect as a normal change in bowel elimination as a person ages? One, absorptive processes are increased in the intestinal mucosa. Two, esophageal emptying time is increased. Three, changes in nerve innervation and sensation cause diarrhea. Or four, mastication processes are less efficient. And guys, the correct answer is four, mastication processes are less efficient. So think about it. As the patient gets older, guys, it's just like wear and tear of the body. So, you know, um, something very important. If you guys have been following me with fundamentals when it comes to the aging adult, I tell you this all the time. As the person gets older, their sense of thirst decreases. So number one, you have a person that's drinking less that places that patient at risk for what? constipation then number two um mastication that chewing they're not um the chewing process becomes less okay that puts them at risk for um uh, constipation because now they got all of these bulks of food that the gi tract is supposed to be absorbing um salivation guys becomes less in the older adult all of these places a patient at risk for what constipation why do i keep saying that because i need you to drill that in your head because i promise you this is a test question as the patient gets older they are more at risk for constipation due to these reasons now let's look at the wrong answer choices one absorptive processes are increased in the intestinal um, mucosa we wish they're decreased that's why that patient's also at risk for what constipation choice two esophageal emptying time is increased false okay it's delayed and the reason that it's delayed is because the patient has decreased motility remember peristalsis that's what makes that gi tract kind of contract to just move that food along right well it slows down in the older adult which allows the food to sit there much longer right and do what harden which causes what constipation and choice three, changes in nerve innervation and sensation cause diarrhea. That's false. Now, the older adult, they do have changes in the innervation and the sensation, but it doesn't cause diarrhea. It actually causes the opposite. What? Constipation. So if you guys learned anything from this one question, is that the older adult is at risk for what, ladies and gentlemen? Let's say it together. Constipation. Very good. Moving on. Next question. An eight-month-old infant is hospitalized with severe diarrhea. The nurse knows that the major problem associated with severe diarrhea is one, pain in the abdominal area, two, electrolyte fluid loss, three, presence of excessive flatus, or four, irritation of the peritoneal and rectal area. And guys, the correct answer is two, electrolyte and fluid loss. Now, again, if you've been following me for any amount of time, you know me. I teach you a million times the importance of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's how you prioritize patients. What is the most important? And physiological integrity is always going to take precedence. What is physically keeping that patient alive? Nutrition, hydration, vital signs, airway, breathing, circulation, hemodynamic status, glucose, rest and sleep fluid and electrolytes, right? Go back to this question. This is an eight month old infant. The smaller the body, the faster that that patient will go down on you, okay? So this is an eight month old infant and it doesn't only say diarrhea. What type of diarrhea? Severe diarrhea, which means that this patient is losing lots and lots of fluid um, through the stool. So that patient uh, places that patient 
at electrolyte and fluid um, uh, loss. And yes, that patient may have uh, pain in the abdominal area, but is that a priority to us? Absolutely not. I talked to you guys about this. Pain only becomes a priority in certain circumstances, such as burns, such as myocardial infarction, such as uh, stones. And I don't care what kind of stones, whether it's kidney stones, uh, calcium, struvite, if they're stones, you know, that's a priority. What else? Sickle cell, right? In those situations, you can put burn, uh, you, excuse me, you could put pain in the same category you would put physio, everything else that falls under physiological integrity. But outside of that, it's not going to kill the patient. So pain is not going to be a priority. But you better believe that fluid and electrolyte will be because that can kill a patient. Okay? Next question. A client's to have a stool test for occult blood. The nurse is instructing the client, excuse me, instructing the nursing assistant in the correct procedure for the test. The nursing assistant is correctly informed that one, sterile technique, sterile technique is used for collection. Two, stool should be collected over a three-day period. Three, the specimen should be kept warm. Or four, a one-inch sample of a form stool is needed. And guys, the correct answer, the only correct answer, guys, number one, a one inch uh, sample of formed stool is needed. We only need a, a small amount, okay, to test. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, a sterile technique. You don't need sterile technique for this procedure. It's just a clean technique, okay? Two, stool should be collected over three over a three day period. Um, that's actually the stool that we collect over a three day period. That's when we're collecting um, the fecal um, fat, okay? When we want to actually measure how much fat is in the stool, that's when we'll collect it for a three day period. Choice three, the specimen, I should have worn my glasses, right? The specimen should be kept warm. That's actually when we're testing for like um, ova or parasites. That's when you're going to keep the stool um, warm. So for occult blood, the correct answer is number four. We just need a small sample, about a one inch sample. A client who recently underwent surgery and now has a colostomy is correctly instructed by the nurse for the next few weeks, the client's diet will include foods such as one, vegetables, two, fresh fruit, three, whole grains, or four, poached eggs and rice. I love this question. Okay, guys, the correct answer is four, poached eggs and rice. Before I tell you why, I want to go back and tell you why number one, two, and three are wrong and something I want you guys to notice when you're testing because you're not always going to know what the correct answer is, but you got to start using clues that are given to you, right? If you read this question and choices and you didn't know what the answer was, you should have looked at your choice and say, okay, is there something that all of these choices have in common that one doesn't? If it's a multiple choice, the one that doesn't choose that answer. When we're looking at this, choices one, vegetables, choices two, fresh fruits, choices three, um, whole grains, all of these are high in what? Fiber. So even if you didn't know what the answer was, you should have seen a pattern in choice one, two, and three, and you should have said to yourself, well, I don't know what the answer is, but choices one, two, and three all have something in common, so I'm going to choose the oddball out. And guys, I'm only talking about if you don't know what the answer is, how to you know try to get the right answer. If you know what the answer is, don't use this technique, just choose the right answer. So anyway, let's go back to number four, the um, poached eggs and rice. So fish, chicken, eggs, and when I say eggs, po notice it said poached eggs, right? The reason it said poached eggs is because we don't want fried eggs. That's why they specifically said poached eggs. All of these are good choices for that patient that just had a colostomy. We do not want a patient who just had a colostomy to eat foods that are high in fiber because they just had surgery. We're really trying to rest that gut. We're not trying to make them work too hard. We're not trying to stretch the walls of the GI tract, are we? So that's why we need the low um, vegetables such as the poached eggs, the rice, the chicken. Okay, let's look at the wrong answer choice. And just like I said, vegetables, fresh food, rice, all of these are high in fiber. And we will, we will, we really want to rest the bowels after uh, uh, that type of GI surgery. And so that's why number four is the correct answer.
Clients been admitted to an acute care unit with diagnosis of biliary disease. The nurse suspects that the feces will appear one, bloody, two, pus filled, three, black and tarry, or four, white or clay colored. And guys, the correct answer is four, white or clay colored. Why? The bile is missing. Bile is what gives that stool that darkened color, right? Go back to the question. It says the client has what kind of disease? Biliary disease. So we know that the gallbladder, those uh, bile ducts, or maybe a combination of both, that's what's in trouble. But the fact that we know bile is involved and you know it's most likely not going to be sufficient because this is the disease, we're going to see that stool not having that dark color, but being being a uh, clay or white color. Now let's look at our other um, our guys. I cannot speak. You guys know I can't speak on my videos. Be patient with me. Our other wrong choices: one, bloody. When it's bloody, as in that bright red color, that bloody color, um, you should suspect G GI bleeding, but specifically lower GI bleeding. That's why it still has that red color because it's fresh coming from that lower GI tract. Choice two, pus field. Whenever you see something with pus, what are you supposed to think of? Infection. Choice three, black and tarry. When is black and tarry, you're thinking of bleeding, but you're thinking more of GI bleeding. GI bleeding, more upper GI bleeding, right? So wherever that uh, upper GI bleed is, originally it would have that reddish bloody color, but as it's going through the GI tract, by the time it comes out of that rectum, it's turned what? Black and tarry. So you're still gonna suspect uh, GI bleeding, but an upper GI bleeding versus that fresh bright red blood, which would be what? Lower GI bleeding. So guys, number four is the correct answer. The client asked the nurse to recommend a bulk forming foods that may be included in the diet. Which of the following should be recommended by the nurse? One, whole grains, two, fruit juice, three, rare meats, or four, milk products. And guys, the correct answer is one, whole grains. So fruits, vegetables, guys, they absorb fluid. Okay, they absorb fluid and cause what? Bulk in the GI system, okay? It makes the, the, the stool he heavier. That's why it's called bulk because that's exactly what it does. It bulks up the stool. Now look at our wrong answer choices. Two, fruit juice. Three, rare meats. Four, milk products. These don't add bulk to the stool, but fruits and vegetables do because everything you drink, it just soaks up all of that fluid and it adds bulk to the stool. The client's taking medications to promote defecation. Which of the following instructions should be included by the nurse in the teaching plan for this client? One, increased laxative use often causes hyperkalemia. Two, salt tablets should be taken to increase the solute concentration of the extracellular fluid. Three, emollient solutions may increase the amount of water secreted in the bowel. In the bowel. Or four, bulk forming additives may turn the urine pink. And guys, the correct answer is three, emollient, emollient solutions may increase the amount of water secreted in the bowel. Absolutely, it can cause the patient to have watery stools. That is absolutely the truth. Let's talk about the wrong answer choices. One, increased laxatives often causes hyperkalemia. No, it causes hypokalemia. Why? Because you're losing all that potassium through your stool, okay? Choice two, salt tablets should be taken to increase the solute concentration of the extracellular fluid. No, it should not. That is absolutely false. And choice four, bulk forming additives can turn the urine pink. Guys, that's crazy. That's absolutely false. They made that up. No, it doesn't. So the correct answer is three. While undergoing a soap suds enema, the client complains of abdominal cramping. The nurse should, one, immediately stop the infusion, two, lower the height of the enema container, three, advance the enema tubing two to three inches, or four, clamp the tubing. And guys, the correct answer is lower the height of the enema container. And I know what you're thinking because you're saying, you know, Professor D, you said whenever patient getting a transfusion, Whenever patients get a transfusion, if something goes wrong, we should stop the transfusion. First of all, this is not transfusion the patient's getting. They're, this is an enema. But even more important than that, two, we're going to expect some cramping. It's an enema that you're giving the patient so they can have a bowel movement. With that being said, if you know that um, 
that uncomfortable feeling is that cramping becomes too much, you're just going to lower it. You're not gonna stop it, you're just gonna lower it. And the reason you don't stop it is because the patient needs the medication, right? But the reason you lower it, the higher that you have that bag, the faster it's rushing into the patient. That's what may cause those really bad cramping. But the more that you lower it, the slower the medication goes into the patient. So the patient's still getting the medication, they're just not getting it as fast. So the feeling will not be as harsh. And that's why um, number two is the correct answer. Let's talk about the wrong answer choices. One, immediately stop the infusion. No, if you stop the infusion, how are they gonna get that medication which they need? This is not a reaction the patient's having that's life-threatening. We kind of expect them to cramp up a little, okay? Choice three, advance. Advance the enema tubing two to three inches. Stop it. You don't do that. You just slow it down. And you slow down the the um, flow by just lowering that bag. Um, choice four, clamp the tubing. Absolutely not necessary. Okay? So the correct answer is number two. These answer choices are funny sometimes. All right, guys. The nurse who's caring for a post-op client on a surgical unit knows that for 24 to 48 hours post-op, clients who have undergone general anesthesia may experience one, colitis, two, stomatitis, three, paralytic ileus, or four, gastrocolic reflex. And guys, the correct answer is three, paralytic ileus. So guys, paralytic ileus is when um, the peristalsis of the GI tract stops completely. This is transient. It's going to... The peristalsis is going to come back as the anesthesia is eliminated from the body. So as the patient, you know, the anesthesia is going down, the peristalsis is going to start to go back up and it usually takes about 24 to 48 hours. So number three is the correct answer. For clients with hypocalcemia, the nurse should implement measures to prevent one, gastric upset, two, malabsorption, three, constipation, or four, fluid secretion. And guys, the correct answer is three, constipation. That is one of uh, the things you'll see in the patient that's experiencing hypocalcemia. Along with that, patient may have uh, muscle cramps, <coughs> excuse me, um, tetany, uh, paresthesias, you know, that tingling sensation, all of those are signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia. The nurse is to receive K-exalate enema. The nurse recognizes that this is used to one, prevent constipation, two, remove excess potassium from the system, three, reduce bacteria in the colon from colon before diagnostic testing, or four, provide direct anti-diarrheal medication to the intestine. And the correct answer is to uh, remove excess potassium from the system. That's true, guys. And here's the trick. When you see that medication k exhalate, that K, think of potassium. What is your symbol for potassium? Isn't the K with the little plus, plus sign? So when you see k exhalate, remember potassium. So what this medication does, it binds the potassium. So when the patient has a bowel movement, all of that potassium comes out in the stool. So that is the absolutely correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, prevent further constipation. That is false. That's not what it does. Uh, three, reduce bacteria in the colon before diagnostic testing. Um, neomycin enemas, that's what it does. Okay. Not k -exalate. And choice four, provide a direct anti-diarrheal medication to the intestine, false. The correct answer is choice two. Like I said, it binds the potassium. So when the patient has a bowel movement, all of that potassium will come out in the stool. The appropriate amount of fluid to prepare for an enema to be given to an average size school, school age child is three. 300 to 500 mLs. That is the correct amount. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. Choice one, 150 to 250, that's what you'd give to an infant. Choice two, 250 to 350, that's what you'd give to a toddler. And then choice four, 500 to 750, that is what you'd give to an adolescent. So the correct answer for a school age child would be 300 to 500 mLs. 
Which of the following is an appropriate nursing intervention for a client with an NG tube in place? One, tape the tube up and around the ear on the side of the insertion. Two, secure the tubing to the bed by the client's head. Three, mark the tube where it exits the nose. Or four, change the tubing daily. And guys, the correct answer is three, mark the tube where it exits the nose. And guys, you can either do that with like tape or a red pen. But that is the correct answer. Now, remember, you're going to do this only after placement has been confirmed by x-ray. So the patient gets a, gets a tube, um, x-ray has confirmed it's in the stomach and not anywhere else like the lungs, right? So then you want to mark it either with like a, like I said, a red pen or tape. And the reason you're doing that is so you can know if displacement happens. Now let's look at the other choices. Choice one, tape the tube up and around the ear on the side of insertion. No, you just tape it to the nose, not the ear. That's false. Uh, choice two, secure tubing to To the bed do we do this guys never secure tubing to the bed no you're going to secure it to the patient's gown not to the patient's bed choice four change the tubing daily no you don't change it the tubing doesn't need to be changed daily now what does need to be done daily is irrigation of the tube right so you're going to irrigate the tube daily The nurse instructs the client that before the fecal occult blood test, she may eat one, whole wheat bread, two, a lean T-bone steak, three, veal, or four, salmon. Choices two, three, and four are really making me hungry. Okay, and the correct answer, guys, is choice one, whole wheat bread. That's only the safe choice out of all of these choices that have been given. This patient's about to get a fecal occult blood test, so we're looking for blood that's hidden in the patient's stool. Choices two, three, and four, all of them can cause false positive results. So we'll get a result that's positive, but it's not really positive, false positive just because of what they ate. So if the patient's gonna get a fecal occult blood test, we're gonna teach them to stay away from food such as a, tea, a steak, veal, salmon, okay? The only safe choice here is one, the whole wheat bread. The nurse is discussing arteriosclerosis and its effects on, it has on the body with an older adult client. Although the most commonly recognized effect is on the cardiovascular system, the nurse should include which of the following statements regarding its effect on the GI system to complete the discussion. One, circulatory problems make getting to the bathroom easily problematic. Two, the benefit you get from your food is also decreased by this condition. Three, the aging process that causes vascular problems also causes elimination process problems. Or four, the problem it creates with blood flow also affects blood flow to the bowels and so affects elimination. Before I tell you what the answer is, I will say this. You should have at least, you should have at least um, narrowed your answer down to choice two and choice four. Because choice two and choice four are both factual statements. But the correct answer is choice four because choice four is more detailed. It gives you the exact reason why this is happening. If four wasn't here, two would have been the answer. So let's talk about four. The problem it creates with blood flow also affects blood flow to the bowels. And so it affects elimination. And that is absolutely true. So guys, the, what we're talking about is arteriosclerosis. So we have the blood vessels, you know, especially this is older, eight, um, older adult. As you get older, those vessels just start to harden. They don't stretch as much as they used to. And on top of that, the older that you get, the longer you've been eating foods that are high in what? Cholesterol. So you've got that plaque that's sticking along the inner lining that's making the 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 lumen of the vessel more narrow which means it's bringing more blood flow remember in blood is the oxygen the vitamins the nutrients that all of your tissues need to absorb right including your gi tract so that's something else that's going on and um because of that decreased blood flow it slows down peristalsis it keeps food sitting there in the gi tract longer which allows the uh, patient to be what constipated on top of that, guys, 
um, decreased blood flow to the GI tract decreases the GI tract's ability to absorb import to absorb to absorb important nutrients. So I just told you what three or four reasons why arteriosclerosis is um, harmful or detrimental to the GI tract, and that's why number four is the correct answer. And guys, I must have been speaking really fast because I can't believe it, but we are already down to our last question. If you want to see more questions on this, guys, please make sure you leave me a note in the comments and I'll make sure I prepare another video for you. Last question. Which of the following statements made by an older adult reflects the best understanding of the role of fiber regarding the bowel patterns? One, the more fiber I eat, the fewer problems I have with my bowels. Two, whole grain cereals and toast for breakfast keeps my bowel moving regularly. Three, my wife makes whole grain muffins. They are really good and good for me too. Or four, I, I used to have trouble with constipation until I started taking a fiber supplement. And guys, the correct answer is two, whole grain a cereal and toast for breakfast keep my bowels moving regularly. Why? Did you guys notice the, um, there's been a common theme with throughout this whole video, okay? Foods that are high in fiber increases bulk in the stool, promotes peristalsis, which promotes elimination. So that way it decreases the chance of the patient being what? constipated. So number two is the correct answer. Guys, I hope you found this video to be helpful. If you'd like to see more content um, on this or anything else, please be sure to leave me a comment below. Let me know what you think about this video. Please do not forget, guys, I have audio lessons. I've got my tumblers available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Very soon, I'm going to have um, study guides for you test guides on my website. Don't forget to check me out on my other social media platforms. My handle is still the same, Nexus Nursing. I have a podcast for nurse practitioners and registered nurses, students. Same platform, um, the name of uh, my handle. Brr, my handle name is the same, Nexus Nursing. And guys, please, if I have helped you in any way and you really want to support this channel, do one thing for me, share this video, share my content. I'm really trying to go grow guys. I'm trying to um, do this for you guys 100% of the time, 100% of the time. I don't want my attentions elsewhere, but in order for that to happen, my channel has to be supported guys. So I'm asking you, please, each and every one of you take just a moment and share just one of my videos on your social media uh, network, friends, family, coworkers, whoever you think would benefit from this video. And of course, guys, do not forget to like and subscribe below. Thank you for watching and you'll see me next time.